Um, well, welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, this is the third hour of our three-hour hangout where we are visiting with experts from a variety of, of areas. Um, our first hour was spent with Al Tompkins, where we talked with where we talked about accuracy. Our second hour was spent with Kenny Irby, where we talked about images and how those images were handled. In this hour, we're going to talk about social media. And I'm joined by Drew Curtis. Hi, Drew. Hey, what's up? Hey, Eric Martin from Reddit. Eric, can you say that again? We are not getting your sound. Um, so check and see if you get a mute button clicked. And um, Monica Guzman um, from the Seattle Times. Hey, everyone. Eric, you might have to take your headphones off. Um, so last week seemed like a seminal moment in, the, in a media shift. Um, I think of other moments in media development like the OJ car chase that we watched live on CNN or even the invasion of Kuwait where we realized that something new was happening in media. Um, last week had that kind of feel for me. And Monica, I really want you to start off, since you're not associated with, with a social media platform per se, um, I want you to start off by telling us how you described the events of last week and what was so significant about that. Yeah, I, I agree with you that something felt like it had shifted. Something felt like it changed. And I think two, two big dynamics happened um, as a result of something we've seen before, which is a very large big developing story. That part isn't new. Um, two things were new. One, people, it turns out, want more. They want more information. They want to get as much information in a developing story as is possible. And for the first time, we were able to see one particular stream of information, very raw information, a police scanner, be accessible and available on a broad scale uh, and be picked up and listened to by a whole lot of people around the country. So people wanted that raw information that had very interesting results and consequences. The second big dynamic that I think played a part in, in the whole week was people want to come together. When something big happens that shuts down a city, uh, that has a, a potential terrorist on the loose, um, people want to talk about it. And at one point, Things started happening in the middle of the night, and it turns out people still want to talk about it. They're in their homes. They're mostly alone, but they have their computers. So I think those two instincts, the instinct to want more and more and more and be as connected to a raw developing story as possible, drove people to some novel ways of getting raw information that had consequences. And secondly, they wanted to talk about those experiences. They wanted to come together around them. There was unity. There was so much powerful emotion. And, and those two things combined to, I think, reveal some serious changes in the way we share information. Yeah, and this fits into a concept that you talk about in a chapter that you wrote for a book that Pointer is about to publish called The New Ethics of Journalism, and you talk about the community's ability to self-inform, how it's no longer the part of, it's no longer our role as journalists to, to only inform the community, that they actually have a lot of power themselves. Yes, and I think with, with that power comes a lot of responsibility. It's something professional journalists have known all along, and I think it's, it's actually a beautiful thing, if at times a disturbing thing, to see members of the public learn those lessons organically, the lessons that maybe have been taught in journalism schools, members of the public picking them up little by little, realizing, wow, I tweeted out with a lot of confidence the names of two suspects that were not really suspects, and what confirmation did I have? The fact that a lot of my friends said that that was the case, that's not, that's not confirmation, that's amplification. These little lessons, yeah. I kept seeing people pick them up organically and naturally. So it's, it's, it's the entire public um, realizing how powerful information is and that they wield that power. I think it can be a beautiful, incredible thing. I think as journalists, we need to ask what roles uh, are added to our jobs uh, in addition to just informing, maybe modeling good, good behaviors, maybe encouraging great information communities. I, I think and hope that that can be what we do. All right. Eric, let's try it again. Can we hear you now? 
Yes. Uh, can you hear me all right? I can. I can. I can. Yeah. So how would you describe Reddit's particular role last week? Sure. I mean, the majority of activity on Reddit was was similar. Um, you know, a after any big news event or or tragedy, you see, you know, people just looking for information there. So you saw people doing these sort of live, almost like live update threads, where they're making you know 50, 60 edits to a sort of block of text um, with continuous updates and corrections on you know this news site is reporting this, this person tweeted this, here's a photo, here's this, here's that. And then in the comment threads, which sometimes were, you know, there were you know twenty thousand comments in in, a, in some of these sort of news threads. People were, you know, doing everything from talking about okay, what area is that in, or you know, I was I was in the race, or my friend was at the race, and you know, the, 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 this is what they told me. So people were just kind of sharing all kinds of different information in the immediate um, aftermath of the bombing, and then uh, you know, sort of after that, people uh, were you know, kind of helping people who were stranded find uh, accommodations, transportation, um, and just still trying to, you know, kind of share and aggregate whatever news they, they could find out there. And it's funny because, I mean, Reddit has a history of trying to do good. I mean, I, I think people might not remember this, but there was this video of a um, middle school Bully essentially berating um, a bus aide, um, and it was the Reddit community that, that shed light on that video and raised money for that bus aide. So it's not like, like those things that you just described are unusual for the Reddit community. They tr they think of themselves, or at least a portion of the Reddit community, thinks of itself as a helpful community, right? Right. I mean, we saw the same thing after the uh, tsunami in in uh, in Japan. Uh, or the, the earthquake, and uh, people were just doing everything from, yeah, trying to find out what happened and, and get updates and pictures, but also there were people who um, were on the, you know, nearby, on the ground, who uh, I remember one person went and got um, groceries for someone, another user's grandmother. Wow. And pictures and shared that. So a lot of, uh, you know, anytime something's happen something happens, uh, you know, th th there'll be firsthand accounts from people who, were, were there or, or have some sort of um, you know, connection or insight to what was going on. Right, and, and, and less people think we're glossing over. Um, uh, you know, one particular thread on Reddit was titled, Find Boston Bombers, and this is what most people outside of Reddit are talking about these days. And on that thread, you had a large number of people who were searching through videos and photos trying to identify anybody that might be somehow suspicious. Right. I mean, I, I, um, by large number, I mean, we're talking about a few hundred um, with several thousand kind of looking along, um, just to put it in, in, in uh, scale. And further so, perspective, how many users on Reddit? Um, at any, you know, during the sort of height, we're talking um, hundreds of thousands. In a, in a given day, you're talking several million, but hundreds of thousands at any one particular point in time. And, so and, and, and tell me, how was that thread, um, at its height, how many people were on that thread? A few thousand. Okay. All right. Um, Drew, you've been running FARC, which is another similar social media site, um, for several years. What was going on on FARC um, last week? And um, then I want to do a follow-up question and have you describe different social media platforms for me. Yeah, so one of the differences between Reddit and FARC is, is we're an edited platform, so there's a lot more going on with what we choose to put up there and whatnot. And as a result, I spent a lot of time sort of going through the different news sources and what we were hearing and trying to figure out, like, who's, who's accurate here? Why, why is the New York Post so different from everybody else? Why is CNN only reading Twitter? You know, these things actually do make a difference. And one of the things that happens during breaking news is you find that the local guys usually have a much better handle of the situation than anybody else does because they're there, obviously. Um, so a lot of it was, you know, pointing out whether or not there was an actual problem going on, uh, what seemed to be right about the reports, what not, like, you know, counter arguments, like, you know, the fact that the New York Post was the only people to label some guys early on uh, also meant something. And then when there were contradictions, basically surfacing those very quickly and trying to make sure that there was sort of just a better idea of what was going on from the ground. And at the same time, talking to members of the community who lived there, who could, you know, lean outside their doors and say, yeah, this is what I see on the street right now. 
And so tell me the difference, or tell our audience the difference. Um, you've described the difference between Reddit and um, FARC. Um, so, so, so layer on here, um, you know, another community that we've talked about a little bit is 4chan. Um, and, then, and then you have the broader social networks of Facebook and Twitter. How do each of those networks behave differently in recent times? Well, they sort of, the range is basically from community to platform. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, for example, Twitter is sort of an everything goes kind of place, uh, Reddit to a certain extent as well. FARC is more of an edited, highly moderated, uh, which is probably hard for most people to believe, but believe it or not. Uh, and so as a result, I spent a lot of time trying to catch, you. like, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Try to spend a lot of time trying to catch patterns. Um, for example, if I see a news source that's only reading Twitter or is clearly copying, then that is to be distrusted. But I'll give you an example. Like when CNN uh, started reporting that there was a suspect in custody heading towards the courthouse, uh, I'm flipping back and forth between that, MSNBC, Fox, and I got stuck on Fox because Fox was struggling with this, which was kind of odd. Normally, when something gets out into the news sphere, it tends to get repeated by everybody, but Fox was struggling with it. And eventually, when they finally launched it, they, said they did it in a very interesting way. They say, we can't confirm this, but news sources are saying. And I thought that was really interesting because it wasn't really a hedge. They were actually saying, we can't confirm this, but we sat on this for an hour. We have to say something about it. It was so when I saw that go, I thought, hmm, something, something strange is going on here. And that happened on numerous, numerous occasions during the news cycle. I was going to write up a large piece on everything that went wrong, but it would have just been too long and really, really boring, I think, at the end of the day, because I think we can all sort of judge this from a 30,000-foot view and say, what, what the hell was going on exactly? Now, um, pretty early on, people were critical of Reddit, Eric. Um, on Wednesday of that week, Alex Madrigal um, published a column on theatlantic.com that basically said, hey, Reddit, knock it off. What effect did that criticism and other outside criticism have on the community? Um, I mean, it definitely uh, increased the attention on that one, uh, that one small uh, section. Um, and so you had all of a sudden a lot of people watching that, um, individuals as well as you know, people in the media. And and here is here is um, here is that um, that that page. Now, actually, you were at an event that Wednesday, and I was there too in New York. You were at Paid Content Live, right? Correct. Correct. Right. And and at the time that this was being published, um, you were you were actually on stage, and um, you said um, you said something to the effect of. We are the groundskeepers. What did you mean by that when you were when you were responding to that question? Because I think it was essentially a question that was asking about this same behavior. Right. So it was it was asking about that particular um, subreddit as well, I believe. And yeah, I mean, we we say that a lot that we're the groundskeepers, and by that we mean you know we are responsible for sort of you know determining rules, determining. Um, you know, the, the, you know, providing the actual platform where people will build these communities. Um, and in a certain sense, we are, you know, responsible for decisions that can go to cultivate these different communities, but we're not, you know, choosing which, which communities to create. We're not choosing some of the, both the technical and uh, design and, of course, content and, and decisions in the communities themselves. And in most cases, they're kind of chosen um, you know, organically through the, the moderators and, and people in that community. So, Monica, I'm interested in that. You um, sort of are, are fairly recent to Reddit. You joined a couple months ago and started looking at it um, as you were writing the book, uh, the chapter in the book. And tell me, um, tell me what you noticed. What observations did you make about, about that effect that um, Eric just described on the community. What happens to a community when they get to set their own terms? I, I've been really interested in that for a little while, and the reason is um, I think about newspaper site comments, and a lot of newspaper reporters have sort of given up on them, and they say, okay, it's a necessary evil, it gets us more traffic, it gets the community talking, but it's, it's, so, it's such a wild west. Uh, people don't really know what they're talking about or what they're saying. What I really admire about Reddit is the whole idea of basic formula. You have a platform. 
you have moderators and you have rules. And the moderators have actual power and the rules have actual force. And I have seen subreddits that blow my mind with the amount of collaborative action that they can inspire uh, among their communities. And um, since I've learned about that, I've wondered how, you know, what can journalists learn from those models? I've been very inspired by it. So when I saw Find Boston Bombers, it, it was a very natural outgrowth of that capacity that Reddit has and the feelings that people had in the wake of this crazy news story, where now we have, oh my gosh, there's a lot of photos from that. What can, you know, users on Reddit, I think it's a natural and good question. What can we do to help? Is there something we can do to help? Um, so I've heard it called in the media an experiment, um, that site. And, and Eric, I'd be interested to hear your take on that, you know, whether you consider that an experiment. To me, it's just, it's just the natural thing to try and to do. So I didn't find the effort at all uh, with a bad intention or anything like that. I thought, yeah, that's exactly what a, a, a space that has both moderators and rules would try to make happen. Um, did it work? No. <laughs> I mean, clearly there were a lot of problems. But, but I hesitate to vilify the effort. And, and I want to remind our audience that you can tweet questions to us at hashtag race for truth. Um, Eric, um, tell me, was it an experiment? Um, in, in a certain sense, the, the idea of having you know, a, a particular section, in, in our case, a subreddit where people were trying to investigate this is, is yeah, I agree, it's not. Uh, surprising, um, you know, and, and and we saw not just on, on Reddit, but you saw elsewhere people trying to, you know, speculate on all kinds of things. Um, and we saw that happen not just in that one subreddit at our site, but but elsewhere on our site as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, it it uh, it's also something that's very common online, where you know, I guess the most uh, you know, maybe one of those common examples is that there'll be a video of, of someone getting mugged or a video of someone abusing animals and you'll have people kind of collectively try to figure out who it is and, 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 and often in, you know, like this situation in a very dangerous sort of uh, vigilante way. Um, so yeah, it, it certainly was not um, surprising that that would be a, a, a something people would try to do. Does that word vigilante make you nervous? Yeah, and we have, you know, we have, uh, you know, one. We only have like, you know, basically six rules on Reddit, and one of them is you can't post people's personal information. That includes names, that includes, you know, addresses, of course, uh, you know, links to Facebook, Twitter, that kind of thing. Um, for that, for that very reason. Drew, I'm really interested. You have been observing these communities for. A decade now? Is that is that too long? Am I stretching that out? No, it's actually almost 15 years now. Okay, so uh, so quite a quite a long time. Um, it seems to me like there's a mentality on these uh, on many of these social sites of us versus them, where the users band together, and and I saw it most frequently last week when users were discussing um, their efficiency with information versus the traditional media's effic efficiency with information. And, and so, so first of all, just, just tell me, do you see that as well, or would you describe it differently? Yeah, I, I would describe it differently. It kind of runs the gamut. I mean, there's always the people who are the self-appointed experts on everything who get stuff and want to be the people that are in the you know and to be able to explain to people what's exactly going on. And on the other end of the spectrum, for the most part, um, the participatory issues we discussed earlier are kind of important to point out that, I mean, at any given time on any website with comments, most people are not actually making comments, and a lot of them aren't even reading the comments if you want to get right down to it. It's, it's a very small subset of people that are actually using the platform. So I, I don't know that it's really an us versus them in the sense that, you know, but it depends on where it's coming from. So, for example, I have a, a friend who's a conspiracy theorist, and he thinks that the media is holding back. I think that the media is not holding back enough. And so it's kind of hard to judge what the range is exactly between the us versus them thing. The one us versus them thing I am seeing, though, is this. I mean, Reddit is getting a lot of flack over the way this, this thing was handled, but why is Facebook not getting any crap about it? Why is Twitter not getting any crap about it? This doesn't make any sense to me. It seems like they've got some kind of an axe to grind here because shouldn't all the other social media platforms, which behave relatively the same way, 
And I would argue that if you wanted to get right down to it, the other ones like 4chan and others probably cause more damage in the long run than anybody else. Yet Reddit is the poster boy for this somehow. This doesn't make any sense to me. Right. I want to put this up. Um, I saw this on um, my Facebook feed. Um, this, this, I think, photo was originally identified on Reddit, but I bet way more people saw it on Facebook than on Reddit. This was the supposed blue robe guy, and um, could you identify him? This is, this is one of my friends who put this up, um, and I, I asked him about it, um, and I think he took it down fairly quickly, but, um, but, but anyway, um, um, it's an interesting... That's a great question. Why do you think that Facebook didn't get more grief, or Twitter didn't get more grief, but Reddit got so much grief? Yeah, it does seem kind of strange to me, because honestly, the lesson here isn't that Internet communities can get out of control. It's that members of some Internet communities can get out of control, and perhaps we should examine that behavior rather than the platform. Maybe the problem is that these people, you know, started calling around to check out who these people were, went out of their way to go over to their houses before anybody knew anything. Perhaps there should be articles written about that rather than attacking social media platforms because it just doesn't make any sense to me. But see, That's honestly, the behavior we're trying to stop, I think. To me, it, it does make a lot of sense why Reddit has gained the flack. I think precisely the dynamics about Reddit that make it such a powerful collaborative platform in its own unique way are exactly what drew the criticism, and that is the fact that it's... It, it, there can be one space with one mission, and people come and flock to that mission, and every conversation about that mission is trapped on that page and begins to build and snowball on that page. So it's, it's this illusion of extra agency, of, of, more, of more sort of power. Um, and I think also the fact that, you know, Eric is here. You know, I don't know that, that we could get someone from Facebook or Twitter to even think like they have a, a voice in this conversation about what those platforms had to do with, with all of this. But Reddit does play something of a role, or at least is perceived to, because there are moderators. There are pages that are taken down, and these things happen more often than Facebook and Twitter, which tend to adopt a completely hands-off approach to what they're Until doing. Until the AP gets hacked. What? <laughs> All right. Um, I have a question from um, from one of our um, Twitter followers, um, Bill Bill Michael or Bill Mitchell. Mitchell. Oh, Bill Mitchell. Hey, Bill. How's it going? Um, Bill is asking about other possibilities for crowdsourcing, like um, Place to Offer, which is a place for mobile, which is a site for mobilizing people after traumatic events. Um, are any of you familiar with some of these other sites and the role that they play? And and do you think they will become more significant in, um, I mean, we're obviously going to have more, more breaking news. It's inevitable. I think the one that I liked a lot was um, uh, Google's, uh, what do they call that, the people locator service or whatever that they've rolled out a few times? I, I forget the name. Does anybody remember? It's a people, people finder. Yeah, that right. one. That one's pretty cool. They've used that since, I think they started that in, what, 2005 during the tsunami? Yeah, yeah. And so, so did you watch that last week at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we main page the heck out of that one because that was that was something that people actually were using. So that that I think that I would see the service like that making a difference in the future for sure. All right. So let's broaden out for a minute. Um, Drew and Eric, you both describe. Um, I would like actually both of you to describe what you know about the users of your site. You must have some demographic demographic information. Um, and then Monica, um, I'd like you to come up with some questions about what you'd like to know about the users of Reddit and FARC. So, Eric? Sure, yeah, so we actually know very, very little. Um, we can tell you roughly 70% of the audience is in uh, the U.S. and Canada. Um, that's about it. Uh, we don't require any personal information when people sign up. Uh, you, you can sign up with an email address, but you don't have to. Um, so as far as demographic information, there's some third-party um, uh, uh, tools and studies out there like Nielsen um, that, that make, you know, guesses and, and, and guesses that seem, um, seem you know, uh, in the right ballpark, uh, but, but we don't actually collect any, any user data. What are some of those guesses? Um, so anywhere between 65 and 70 percent male. And then age, you know, the, the highest concentration of users are 20 to 34. 
So, and, and the reason that I'm asking um, these questions is, is one of the things that we noticed with Facebook is as it went from being something for college kids to something that your grandparents are on, um, it changed the nature of Facebook. And so as user bases evolve, I, I think it's natural to expect that, that uh, the platform will evolve, or at least portions of the platform. So Drew, um, what do you know about your users? Yeah, it's almost exclusively North American, and that has to do with the fact that FARC is sort of humor-centric, and humor is very cultural. Um, I mean, people can't even understand British humor, and that's the same language. So as a result, yeah, it's almost all North American. Um, after that, the demographics that we see on uh, Comscore claim that we're uh, male-centric, but uh, my experience on the in-person uh, meetups that we do is it's over half women that show up to these things. I don't know what that means, but I kind of like it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Monica, questions for them? Yeah, um, I, I guess I'm taking this in a different spin, but the number one question I have about Reddit users are, are they learning? And the main difference between Reddit today and so many other uh, bigger social networks today is anonymity. So I've, I've seen in the last couple of days an interview with the, the user who created the Find Boston Bombers page, and of course he didn't want to reveal his name. So... I think that's part of what bothers people, is that it's, it, it, it's got some of that dynamic where people come together, they make a mistake, and maybe they apologize, but they apologize under a handle. So who's the real person behind the apology? And then many of them delete. And this happened on Twitter, this happened all over the place. People deleted posts that, yes, circulated you know, what turned out to be wrong information, but also covered up culpability. And, and makes going back and, and uh, taking stock of what happened very difficult. So that, that's one of my questions is, is, is how, are, are Reddit users learning and how accountable might they be for their actions and what will they do next time? I, I want to hear from Eric, what do you think will happen next time something like this is replicated? Uh, do you think things will go differently? Was that an experiment that failed and therefore will not happen again with fine Boston bombers? Or will it just happen again because that's the community. I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, in general, we do see, you know, communities, communities learn, but, but in a very, um, you know, in, in perhaps a very narrow set, so, um, and, and, and with very short memory in general. Um, so I think, you know, I think people will be more, you know, I hope, but, but I also, you know, based on uh, things in the past, I think um, people will learn. I think, you know, as Reddit has evolved, the, the sort of people who are running the individual smaller communities have, have sort of collectively created more and more and better tools, um, as have we. Um, but, you know, the, the great thing about Reddit is that you can have a community, um, you know, start, um, you know, one day and, you know, days or, or weeks later become, you know, huge, um, you know, almost like a huge site in and of itself. And so with that comes a lot of, um, you know, it comes a lot of different choices that the moderators and, and the individuals in the community have as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, different things that can be done in the future to try to, uh, you know, try to mitigate some of the, some of the danger of just this type of information flying around. And, and um, I want you to pay attention to the part of her question about responsibility or accountability. Is there a way to hold them accountable? Um, I mean, just like everything else on, on, on Reddit, I mean, people are anonymous, but they have, um, you know, the, they have sort of an identity on, on within that site or within that community, um, you know, the same way, uh, you know, people know each other on, on message boards and, and things like that. Um, they may not know the person's real name, but it's a... It's a persona and, and an identity. Um, so yes, it's certainly. I mean, that's one of the things that makes um, you know pseudo anonymous communities great is that it's not connected to your real life. So you can talk about you know politics or sports or you know whatever uh, things related to your job that maybe uh, you can't talk about in, in in public. You know, sort of on on Facebook or Twitter where everyone can see it. Um, but yes, it also makes um, that kind of accountability. Um, uh, you know, not not. Uh, uh, it's not the same, but it also feels very different. And and I'll I'll follow up real quick because Reddit has so many levers: uh, the six rules, the many rules on subreddits, uh, the different powers that moderators have. 
and 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 you know everything can be improved what do you think could be improved what levers could be changed so that next time you know a platform that is as powerful as reddit can definitely be maybe shifts somehow biases more of the action toward good than bad next time yeah i mean I, I, there are certainly uh, technical things that can be done there are also sort of um, messaging things that can be done to sort of just you know remind people of, of, of certain uh, uh, things to be careful of but you know I think the more important tool for for changing and improving these is just the the, the knowledge of um, all of the people participating so just you know having this uh, you know, horrible experience of, of innocent people's names being, um, you know, kind of floated out there will, will um, you know, I think make people at least a little bit more careful next time, whether it's on Reddit or somewhere else. So, um, and, and it makes any of the people who are moderating these communities, um, you know, more careful about how they are, are, are choosing to set up uh, actions and, and rules. And, uh, you know, we already saw this somewhat in this incident, uh, where where people you know want to do something, so we, you better give them something you know that's that's uh, uh, you know 100% good and positive to do, or or you know they're going to do things that are that are uh, you know more dangerous. So trying to kind of channel some of that energy and activity into things that that you know are are, are clearly helpful. Eric, how many moderators do you have on Reddit? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it's we have you know thousands and you know even hundreds of thousands of different subreddits or communities, and each each of those has multiple moderators. So so if I, I'm a Reddit um, member and I can create a subreddit and I'm the moderator and I can designate other people the moderator if I choose to. Correct. Right. And tell me, how was the decision made um, to take the subreddit down? Find Boston bombers. Um, yeah, so they act that uh, the people who the moderators, the people who created that community, chose to uh, take it down. Um, so they actually chose, to, you know, I think uh, at first they um, made it private, and then they, or I'm sorry, that they first they kind of uh, froze it in place, and then they made it completely private and essentially took it down. So that decision, you know, was was theirs. Um, Drew, what advice would you have for Eric? Yeah, you know, I, I think the problem is is that, it, it again, you know, we were talking about the, the us versus them mentality and the range of possible outcomes. I mean, when you have a site with hundreds of thousands of millions of people on it, and it only takes 10 people to make the wrong call, it, it's hard to discuss these things in sort of a general, is the community learning? Because what part of the community are we talking about? Are all of them learning? Well, 99.99% .99 of them didn't do anything bad. The other small amount did. And in my opinion, like I said before, I think that the emphasis should not be on is Reddit out of control, but what should people actually be doing in a situation where they think they might have identified somebody? Should they call the guy's house? Probably not. Should they call the FBI? I don't know if that's your thing, sure. I mean, the, the whole point is, is that I think it, it, there should be more emphasis on how individuals should react. And because we're all tied into social media for better or for worse, be it Reddit or Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Uh, this is going to be a permanent part of our lives going forward, and I think a little bit of more information about how, not that, what, I see too many Reddit did bad and not enough these individuals did bad. You know, they shouldn't have tried to locate these people, they shouldn't have done this stuff, and by the way, all stuff that the New York Post did too, which may be why there's not as much discussion about it, I don't know. Right, right. Um, you know, I, that's a great transition because... Um, as I've been observing the changes that have been happening in media over the last, say, five years, one of the things that, that it's occurred to me is that we really live on a continuum now. Um, we live on a continuum where some of us are paid professionally to, to create and distribute information, and other people do it sporadically, and some people do it um, do it quite constantly, but they're not paid for it. And some people are paid, but not necessarily as a paycheck. They, you know, they get advertising from their YouTube channel or something like that. So we all exist on this continuum these days, and um, and, and which, which I think 
I mean, because I think the us versus them, the sort of the amateurs versus the professionals, I think that some of that comes from the professionals, too. I think that a lot of professionals would, would wag their finger and say, look, see, you gotta, you got to leave it up to us. You, you people can't handle it, which is unfortunate, too, because it, nothing is going to change, right? This, this continuum is only going to get more blurry um, and have, have less clear boundaries between who's a professional and who isn't and who's good at this and who isn't. Um, and so, so, so I want to talk about, um, Monica in particular, since, since you are a professional journalist, but you probably have a much greater understanding and sympathy for the, for the online social community than, than most professionals, I think. Um, what do you think professionals can be doing to understand these communities better and maybe even to partner with them? Yeah, um, I think quite a lot, and, and, I, and I, I really couldn't agree with more with what, what Drew was saying. Um, Reddit does have levers, which is why I want to question them and ask, you know, could they be better? But I think at the end of the day, this is absolutely about individuals and individual responsibility, and the people on the end of the continuum who may not, you know, they're not professional journalists, maybe they didn't go to journalism school, I didn't go to journalism school, um, you learn by doing. That If there's one thing I've learned in my career is that that you learn by doing, and guess what? Everybody's doing. So everybody's learning, I hope. Right. So, um, so what could professional journalists be doing uh, to, to better understand that, I think, is understand that there's not that much difference at all between the professional journalist and the person who's doing it sporadically. Often professional journalists do their best work when they're driven and passionate and moved, and that's the same dynamic with the public. Um, you know, they, they learn by doing, but they're, they're learning in this in this huge, you know, sometimes chaotic stream where their emotions are driving them so far. And journalists understand that. We know, you know, we've all made those kinds of assumptions and mistakes when a story is moving by so quickly and we just want to go out with something and we need to exercise restraint. So understanding that all those things are not easy and we don't have some kind of monopoly on them because we're paid to do this stuff. Restraint is hard when something is emotional. Um, discipline is difficult. Uh, balancing being first with being right is difficult. Um, and then, you know, and then, and then proving your value and showing your value and how you share information is hard. So, so yeah, I think a lot of it is sympathy. A lot of it is understanding and, and, and maybe hopefully encouraging the right behaviors and, and holding people up uh, as people who, who wield the same kind of power. You know, so instead of looking down, look, look straight ahead at them and say, all right, you know, we're in this together. Cool. Let's learn from each other. Let's figure it out. And let's understand that this is, this is hard. You know, welcome to our world. Have fun. Let us show you around. Uh, and let's see what we can do. Yeah, you know, earlier on this broadcast, Aaron Brown from Arizona State mm -hmm. University said, adrenaline is not a journalistic tool. And I actually tweeted out that I disagree. I think adrenaline is a journalistic tool. It, at least it was for me. I was a police reporter for years. And even as a religion reporter, which was what I did after I was a police reporter, adrenaline fueled a lot of what I did. It can compromise some of your other journalistic values if you don't hold it in check. And I think that, uh, like, if you're ever tweeting a live event, you get that little surge of adrenaline when you hear the little nugget that you want to tweet or you've got the clever comeback and you just can't get it out fast enough. That's that same, I mean, the, the urge to share information and to be part of the part of the conversation is a significant part of all of us, and that's actually a democratic act when we do that. And so I think um, that 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 urge is, I mean, that, that the existence of that emotion is a democratizing force because we all experience it. Eric, what do you wish that journalists knew about Reddit? I mean, I, I, I would wish that they, um, the, the more people just used it for their own, uh, you know, and experienced it for their own personal interests, not necessarily related to the beat they're covering or their, uh, you know, professional interests, but if they're, uh, you know, Cleveland Browns fan, that they participated in the Cleveland Browns subreddit or, or whatever. They still the have person. that? I, I think so. I think so. Okay, I, I'll look that up. <laughs> um, and so, just to get, I, you know, if, if they're, and, and some of them are very familiar with, with Reddit and all kinds of other online communities, but, but for those that may not, as, may not be as familiar, that they just get um, a, a more first-hand experience of how these things work and how they how you know 
the different sort of sub communities are, are created and cultivated, and, and some are better than others, and, and how they how they function. Now, interestingly enough, I think that um, I mean you have identified yourself on Reddit. Um, you're you're Huey Priest, um, and I, I do want you to eventually tell us what that moniker comes from. Um, but um, but like I put my name on Reddit because I felt like anonymity was a bad idea for me. Monica, when you signed up. Did you come up with a handle, or did you go on as Moni Guzman? I actually have two. I have one that's an anonymous handle, and, and one that is me. And the anonymous handle was an effort to understand, because I had, I had felt like I'd left anonymity behind, but going through Reddit and, and seeing what it could do, you know, convinced me that anonymity can be an incredibly powerful thing. So I wanted to experience that as well, and I still I'm I'm always conscious of what I do. You know, I'm not I'm not going in there messing things around because that's just not who I am. But it's been it's been a very cool experiment. Right, but I think it's one of the issues that journalists need to consider is should you ever be anonymous, um, and and if you are, what you would do, and and the fact that you although the standard on Reddit is to be anonymous, you don't have to be anonymous. I'm on there as Kelly McBride. And and in in I actually did an AMA um, recently, um, and um, and I also noticed I've been on Reddit for a long time, even though I haven't used it very very much until the last two years. Um, but um, Eric, how um, how many people seem to voluntarily identify themselves on Reddit? Um, I, I don't know. I've had to guess. I'd say probably five percent. Um, and, and Small, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just don't know. I mean, a lot of people are sort of known in their communities, um, in, in the different subreddits, uh, and, and some people, you know, their their name is this, you know, like myself. My handle on Reddit is the same as you know on Twitter and you know everywhere else. Uh, and where did that come from? Uh, it was I was working in college for a promotional like um, a company that made you know uh, coffee mugs and. T-shirts and golf balls, you know, sort of promotional products. And anytime they had to put a name on something, they would the name would be Huey Priest. And I have no idea why. This was on all the samples that was the name, and so I just started using that as an online handle. And I, I I don't know if that was a you know I don't know where that came from, but just kind of stuck back back uh, when I was starting to to go online. Yeah, Drew, what do you think journalists can learn from these communities? Well, I think it, it, not a lot, and let me qualify that by saying not a lot, not from an informational standpoint, but there's really no secret to how social media works. It's exactly the same thing we've always done, sped up a thousand times. There's no special sauce. There's no weird trick to it. It's literally the exact same thing you've always done, just a lot easier. And maybe if they learn that, that might clear up a lot of the, the uh, confusion about how everything works. Well, I would disagree. I think that the anonymity in some communities changes some things about the way social media works. You know, uh, I, I've heard that. I think I disagree with it, uh, but I'm not going to be borne out for another couple of years. This is based off of a, uh, a mantra I heard being kicked around in journalism circles about how if you switch your comments over to Facebook, then when people have the real name attached to it, they're not likely to leave bad comments. I argue that that'll just transition in the people who don't mind leaving their name next to bad comments, and we haven't quite got there yet, but uh, give it another couple of years and they'll throw that one out too. I don't think that it really makes a lot of difference, but that's me. All right. Um, so how, um, as we move forward, um, and, and we're working on this con continuum, um, how do you guys think... Um, citizens and, and, and citizens in general as well as citizens on social media um, and, and I'm not sure that there's an exact distinction because most of us are on some form of social media but what responsibility do you think citizens need to take on themselves as they think about consuming news and distributing news and producing news? Um, Monica? Yeah, I think when it comes to distributing news, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm a little radical in this, but I would love for every citizen to consider themselves a journalist. And there's one particular reason I think that's important. Because I think when we try to put barriers around the word, the word journalist, or when somebody says, no, 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 I'm not a journalist, I'm just putting this out there, what they're really talking about is responsibility. It is a synonym for responsibility. When somebody says, no, I'm not a journalist, they're saying, don't hold me responsible. And I say, 
that's not your place to say. If you are sharing critical information to a public that is listening and can be impacted by that information, you have that responsibility. And you're not the one who gets to tell us, gets to tell us that you don't. And I think that's, I, I want to see that go away. That, that ability to say, well, I'm not a journalist, so, you know, when you listen to me, whatever. Just know I'm not a journalist. I'm like, what? no, no, no. Why don't, why don't we instead all accept that we all wield this power potentially at an equal at an equal level you know not all the time but some somebody on the street can be that witness and can be suddenly the most important source in a story and it can happen to anyone at any time I, I just don't want to see the word journalist being thrown around to throw off uh, responsibility that we all have if we are all acting as information sharers yeah, I would say that you're talking more about a democratic responsibility, which if you live in a democratic society, you bear whether or not you accept that responsibility. Eric, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree that I think, um, you know, that we all, we, we all share the same responsibility, uh, uh, you know, we do when we're talking about offline communities um, in the real world as well. I mean, we have a responsibility to, you know, think about, uh, you know, think about what we're saying and, and a responsibility to think about the implications and ramifications of our actions and responsibility to, um, you know, to, to, you know, think about uh, 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 other people that we're interacting with in those, in those communities. So it's, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's much, much uh, closer to the responsibilities we have in, in real life than, than I think it's, it's often portrayed. All right, thanks. Drew, what do you think? I think Monica absolutely nailed it. That's exactly what needs to happen is none of this I'm not a journalist stuff. It doesn't matter. If you're saying stuff that you can't prove, then either say, I can't prove this, here's what I think is going on, or just don't make the statement in the first place. Or as I like to say, if you start uttering phrases like I deny all wrongdoing, that's just like saying I'm guilty. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got a question that I'm going to handle from Twitter here, but um, while I'm doing it, I want to give you guys a heads up because I want to give each of you a chance to ask someone else a question on this panel. Um, so, Eric, in particular, I'd love to see what kind of questions you have for Monica and Drew, you can pick, and Monica, you can pick. So, um, the question that we got from Twitter from um, Taylor is, um, what are the ethical considerations of journalists having multiple Reddit accounts? Can they interact, converse, contradict? And, you know, at first I, I was confused by this question, but the more I thought about it, I think this is actually a really interesting question. Um, one of the things that, that I think is important as a journalist is that you not deceive other people. And, um, you know, so journalists have been, I think, tempted at times to create online personas to entrap people into doing stuff like um, you see it with To Catch a Predator. Um, I've, I've, talk, I've counseled journalists who were reporting on, um, on illegal trafficking of guns and thought about, you know, trying to create a personality to, to buy guns from somebody. Um, I've talked to journalists who were investigating a public official um, who they thought was... Um, inappropriately interacting with teenagers online. And, and I do think that as a journalist, you have a certain promise to not deceive. And, and I, I think you have to be careful of doing that with an anonymous personality. Um, and, and, and in addition to that, I think you have to be wary of not manipulating either. Um, it's very easy to, um, to use anonymity to, to make it appear as if there is some sort of um, force rising up or to s stir something up and and I think that that could be a little dangerous so that was a good question Taylor all right questions Eric what kind of questions do you have um, so, so one of my questions is what uh, you know for for Monica's you know on, on reddit and you know uh, uh, other places online you see uh, more of a cross-pollination between people from different cultures different parts of the world um, and also people from different sort of media environments. Um, you know, we have interactions on, on, on Reddit. You know, in any popular thread, there's going to be people from many countries all over the world. And, um, you know, what, you know, impact, if any, you think that has on, you know, the, the, the media itself, on, on the, the reporting and, and the, the stories that are being covered? You mean, um, do you mean the fact that the those spaces exist where there are powerful communities? What what impact they're having? Um, 
No, I mean, I, I guess more so uh, people from, uh, uh, you know, from, from countries that have a, a very, uh, you know, free and open press and, and places that don't and that have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, different traditions in, in, in media and what's, what's uh, you know, what's, what's every day. Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's an incredibly powerful um, impact. Um, I mean, I'm still floored by the fact that, I, and I've heard this said over and over again, I think Drew hinted at this, you know, to talk about Reddit as one singular entity is completely dumb, frankly. It just, it's just dumb. It's not, it's, not just, it's not even just one space. The way that, even the way that Twitter is in a way one space, Reddit is not one space. It is hundreds of thousands of different spaces. Um, my husband is actually a really big uh, Counter-Strike Global Offensive player. He's on the Counter-Strike Global Offensive subreddit every day and the 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 intimacy and power of that community is so much fun to watch and I love it so um, but when you talk about you know different spaces different things popping up um, it's 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 that ability to form a subreddit tap into a passion um, gather people around it and this can happen anywhere in the world the anonymity can be a force for good it's just it can be a dangerous weapon as well so we have to be careful um, I like to think that if there is some way to instill cultivate a culture of responsibility among everyone, um, you know, professional journalists, non-professional journalists, people who think of themselves as this or that or the other thing, but if we can all take more, more responsibility for the information we share, I, I think Reddit's a great space. I'm rambling, but, but I do think it's a great space. I think it's having great impact. I think, I think it's funny when people in a subreddit start to comment, hey, I think journalists are looking at us, you know, and they're kind of surprised. Like, I, think, I think there's journalists in here, and, and I, somebody wrote something where they quoted us, and that's a little weird, you know. It's like it's like a closed room, but it's open to everyone, and it's it's got the intimacy of a closed room, but it's open. And I think journalists would also do well to respect that. Um, I've seen some sites just kind of grab from from Reddit, sometimes without crediting, sometimes without. It, 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 those are tough issues, but but these are people having fun with each other or sharing something they really care about in in a more intimate and powerful way than I think on a lot of other platforms. Um, so journalists would do well to, you know, understand how that works. Maybe, maybe try to experience it yourself, um, and you know, and, and and not be too much of a weird stalker outsider. Yeah, you know, Monica. I think um, another thing that um, journalists need to be aware of is um, is is being contextual with the information that they might discover on Reddit. Reddit. I mean, the diversity, Eric, that you talk about was pretty. It's pretty amazing on Reddit, and you can find such political diversity. Um, diversity of experience and viewpoint and that's a journalistic value right we are always struggling as professional journalists to try and get more diverse voices into our um, content and, and into our into our work because because that's a journalistic value it's something that, that that is really important as we try and reach the communities that we're trying to reach so reddit could offer a great window or tool or asset into bringing more diversity into your work, but I think you have to be respectful of the community and 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 make sure that you're not taking stuff out of context. You know, you can you can ask, hey, you know, can we can we get together offline? You know, yeah. um, you know, here's how you can find me offline. Um, I'd love to include your viewpoint in my work in some way, or I'd love to brainstorm out a story idea with you. Uh, and and I think that that is. It's a great asset, but I think you have to be really, um, really aware of what the intention of the comments are. And and I, I'm not saying like you can't use stuff that's on Reddit because I think sometimes it's incredibly relevant and and you should use stuff. But but there needs to be a certain balancing act in that and and a certain transparency on the part of the journalist because I think that I think that transparency for professional journalism is becoming even more important. And that may be one of the biggest distinctions between the amateur crowd and the professional crowd is, is what level of transparency you voluntarily bring to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, Drew, what question do you have? Um, yeah, I was actually wondering, and actually this is to both uh, Monica and Kelly, since this is an honest question I know the answer to. We were talking earlier about the responsibility of people to make sure that if they source information online that they... They, uh, th that it's accurate, uh, and we were talking about accountability and like how would anybody hold anybody on Reddit accountable for this? 
what are the standards in journalism for accountability? Because it seems to me that especially the New York Post, but some other guys are kind of due for that. And I'm wondering, like, wh what exactly accountability is happens at a journalism level? Because I just don't know. I, I know there is something, but I'm not sure what it is. Yeah. Monica, why don't you talk about what happens, like, internally in a shop, and I'll talk about some external systems. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think a lot of what happens is you, you – you're out there with an identity and a role that you have embraced that says, I will do right, I will put out what is right, and, you know, that is my job, and that is what you can expect from me, and that expectation is part of the role. So when you fail, when you fall down on that, you should expect and you should welcome <laughs> a lot of anger, um, and, and the accountability comes, comes from that. But I'll say this, uh, overnight, during that night when things went crazy, uh, and that first tweet went out saying that the wrong suspect's name came over the scanner, which turned out apparently not to be true. Many, many journalists tweeted, retweeted that tweet. And I don't know that they felt the brunt of accountability that they might feel for making a more high profile, uh, I shouldn't say high profile, a more visible mistake in an actual, in a published story or something like that. Um, so the journalists, I, I think some journalists were, you know, hidden in among the crowd, having made as big a mistake, but also having that diluted accountability. So it's, it's an issue for everybody. Um, and it's one reason I think personal responsibility is so important, because this accountability thing is not going to be perfect. It's not going to reach everyone all at once. But, but man, it, it hurt to see so many people just delete the tweets, you know. And I, I can't say for a fact that I know of any professional journalists who deleted their tweet. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, it doesn't seem the right thing to do. It seems like we should stand up and fess up and say we'll do better next time. Um, and so for everyone who didn't do that, journalist or not, that's don't do that again. Be, be better than that. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, so there is there is internal accountability. You know, your boss can you know punish you. Um, there's also a, an accountability through the courts. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if somebody sues the New York Post. And in fact, many people are suggesting that somebody should sue the New York Post because because um, that um, that photo was, uh, you know, the bag men photo was absolutely irresponsible for a professional news organization. Um, so so many people are suggesting that. We have like one and a half minutes left before I'm going to wrap. So Monica, you've got a question. What do you want to ask? Oh man, I was thinking about this. I don't know. I don't know that I have a really great one. I think it's it's for Eric. What what do you think is most misunderstood about not just Reddit but that entire space, and not just by journalists but by everyone? What is the one thing you wish people All right, would, Eric, would acknowledge? You, you've got thirty seconds. Yeah, I mean that that people want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Um, and and I uh, I know a lot of people are aware of it, but 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 what that what that means? I mean, the, the motivation behind wanting to be a part and, and, and to you know build something uh, uh, bigger, I think is that's the real reason people are on Reddit and, and other places, not not the follower count or the karma total or whatever, but they they, they want to create something that's that's you know that, that's whether it's community or or, or uh, content that's bigger than themselves. All right, thank you. Um, I want to thank all three of you. Um, you've all been very generous, Eric particularly. Um, thank you very much for, for agreeing to be a part of this. I want to thank Al Tompkins and Kenny Irby, our earlier host from Pointer, and their guests um, who, who g gave generously of their time and were incredibly candid and honest. Um, and I want to um, plug one uh, training event coming up here at the Pointer Institute. The Pointer Reporters Academy is a four-day um, seminar for reporters. It runs May 21st to May 24th, and the deadline for applications is April 30th. Um, this is a training session that will be led by our Dean, Stephen Buckley, um, Tom Wong from the Dallas Morning News, Jackie Banaszynski, um, fairly famous writing and editing um, expert from the University of Missouri, R.B. Brenner, who is currently at Stanford University but used to be at the Washington Post, and Alexandra Zayas um, from the Tampa Bay Times. So it's, it's a star-studded cast of teachers, and um, you, would, you, would do, you, would, you couldn't do better by yourself if, you, um, if you're interested in reporting to, to apply to that seminar. So 
Thank you very much for being with us. Um, this has been a great afternoon. Um, this will be archived at pointer.org, and um, um, please send us any feedback. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks.